Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as we said earlier today, uh, we're very excited about uh, continuing education. Uh, the concept is exciting, and now we have some, uh, some concrete. I'm really proud of what's been done here. I'd like to introduce our next presenters, Dr. Rick Arthur, who's the equine medical director for the California Horse Racing Board. Dr. Sue Stover of the University of California, Davis, is well known throughout the day in any any session like this, you'll find uh, references to her uh, so work that's been so important, everything from toe grabs to other types of injuries. And we have Go Joe Gorachek, who is executive director of the Indiana Horse Racing Commission, and they too have instituted a continuing education program. So I'll turn it over now to Dr. Rick Arthur. Thank you, Ed. Uh at the first, first welfare summit here in 2006, one of the recommendations was to develop CE requirements uh, for trainers and other people handling horses. Uh, the veterinary profession in California, you have to have 32 hours of CE every two years to get relicensed. Uh, RCI has actually come out with a model rule to require four hours uh, a year of continuing education for trainers. And the big problem's always been, besides the, the trying to get these regulations in place, is the availability of CE. And what we've done in California is develop an internet module that uh, trainers can take the uh, continuing education course online uh, and uh, will be able to get their CE hours on uh, musculoskeletal injuries, in this case, uh, through the internet. Uh, this all came about in, in uh, uh, July 1st, 2011, California uh, started an enhanced necropsy program. And I think as everyone knows, California's had a, a very good necropsy program for uh, over 20 years. Uh, over 6,000 horses have been necropsied, a rather sobering number when you think about it. Uh, but now the uh, musculoskeletal injuries are actually sent to the Dr. Stover's lab, the Veterinary Orthopedic Research Laboratory, uh, for in-depth analysis uh, using uh, equipment that's really not available to uh, uh, any most places other than a research laboratory like hers. Um, and what became apparent, and we've known this for years, is that uh, 80 to 90 percent of the horses have pre-existing pathology at the site of their fatal injury. Uh, to be fair to trainers, not all the pre-existing pathology is clinically detectable, but enough is, uh, is dramatic enough that when you see some of these uh, courses on the bath floor, you wonder, how did the trainer miss this? How did the examining veterinarian miss this, or how did the practicing veterinarian miss this? Uh, I'm gonna, we're going to demonstrate the uh, scapular module. Uh, scapula is not a big issue for uh, thoroughbreds. They constitute 2% two, two of the fatal musculoskeletal fatalities in California. There's been two racing fatalities with scapular fractures on the Southern California circuit this year already, however. Uh, but they constitute about 6% of the uh, uh, fatalities in quarter horses. Uh, we expect to have about six of these by July 1st. That's going to cover about 70% of the musculoskeletal fatalities in uh, racing in California. And uh, we think it's a, a real step forward. And uh, hopefully you'll find this interesting and I think it gives an opportunity how we can all work together. This, this program would be available from, for uh, anybody who wanted to sign on to the internet and, and do this. Uh, what I'm going to start with is just the uh, beginning of the module. And you actually go in, you sign up, you have a given a password, and there'll be a, uh, a way to actually do this. It's actually going to be a fee for service. Knowledge and understanding are the keys to preventing catastrophic injuries in racehorses. Educational modules will enhance your knowledge of injuries and circumstances that are associated with injuries. The information will help you prevent catastrophic fracture in racehorses. Welcome to this module on scapula fractures. This educational module will enhance your knowledge of injuries of the scapula or shoulder blade 
and circumstances that are associated with scapular injuries in racehorses. The information will help you detect mild injuries and prevent catastrophic scapular fracture. Armed with the knowledge in this module, you can help prevent scapular fractures in racehorses by knowing where mild scapular injuries occur, when horses are at higher than normal risk for scapular injuries, techniques for detecting scapular injuries, and guidelines for rehabilitating affected horses until scapular injuries are healed. At the end of this lesson, you will be able to name the types of horses that are susceptible to fracture the scapula, locate where the scapula is in the body, identify the anatomy of the scapula, describe the common features of scapular fractures, define stress remodeling and stress fracture, list the indicators of a scapular stress fracture that predisposed to catastrophic fracture, describe times in racehorse careers when horses are at highest risk for having a stress fracture, utilize methods for detecting stress fractures, and understand guidelines for rehabilitation of horses with a stress fracture. So this basically explains uh, how each module will start. We'll tell the, the uh, trainers or uh, assistant trainers or possibly even veterinarians. We expect to have this uh, approved for CE for trainers as well. Uh, that uh, they'll understand what the module's about, what you're going to learn. And I'm going to let uh, Sue Stover go through uh, some highlights uh, that uh, shows you what goes into developing these modules. All right, thanks, Rick. And uh, thank also the Jockey Club, Grayson Jockey Club Research Foundation for uh, providing this opportunity for everyone. So this particular module is the first of several that uh, we're designing, as Dr. Arthur mentioned. Uh, the module itself is approximately 50 minutes in length, including checks along the way to test your knowledge to make sure you're retaining um, information that's needed to understand additional parts of the module. What I'm going to do today is just um, go through some typical slides throughout the module, um, probably lasting only about 15 minutes. As you can see on the left-hand side of the screen is a menu, and so these are meant to be delivered online, so um, take them anywhere you would like at your own pace, and you can go back and forth any order that you'd like. There's also a transcript for each, um, um, each slide, so to speak, so that um, people of differing disabilities, for example, might, will also be able to um, gain information from the module, and also a glossary so that if there are specific terms that are used in the module, for example, lamellar bone, then there will be a definition at the bottom so that people can, can keep uh, on track with the module and not lose them along the way. All right, so skipping around a little bit here, we'll just give you a flavor for some of the things uh, in this module. The scapula, or shoulder blade, is the most proximal bone in the front limb. The scapula lies along the side of the horse's chest, connecting the limb to the body by a muscular sling. The scapula can be recognized by its distinct anatomic features. Its broad, flat geometry provides a large area for muscle attachments. The glenoid at the distal end is cup-shaped to receive the spherical head of the humerus in the shoulder joint. The cartilage at the proximal end of the scapula provides for growth in length of the bone in growing horses. The spine on the outer surface of the bone is a long, narrow ridge that serves as a strut to resist bending by the large forces from the muscles on the inner surface of the scapula. The spine can be felt because it lies just under the skin. The neck connects the large blade of the scapula to the glenoid. Click on each part of the scapular anatomy to learn more. I won't go through each of these, but just to give an example. The spine extends from the top of the scapula to the neck of the bone.
Scapular fractures are serious injuries because they almost always cause the death of racehorses. This scapula is from a racehorse that was euthanized after developing this catastrophic fracture. The same fracture configuration consistently occurs among almost all racehorses that fracture a scapula. Knowledge of the location of the fracture site in the scapula is important for detection of mild injuries to this region. Detection of mild injuries to the scapula is useful because mildly affected horses can be rehabilitated and complete fractures prevented. Let's look at the typical fracture configuration that occurs in racehorses. The major fracture crosses the neck of the scapula. This fracture divides the bone into a larger proximal piece and a smaller distal piece. A second fracture line usually goes into the glenoid and thus enters the shoulder joint. Incomplete fracture lines may course into the proximal portion of the scapula. The pre-existing injury is called a stress fracture. The terms stress remodeling and incomplete fracture refer to variations of the same disorder. The important feature is the location of the stress fracture and associated weakness that greatly increases the likelihood of catastrophic complete fracture. The stress fracture is specifically located at the distal end of the spine of the scapula, where the spine merges with the neck of the scapula. This is a critical piece of information because it enhances our ability to detect a mild injury and provide appropriate treatment to avoid catastrophic fracture and allow return of affected horses to training and racing without detrimental effects on racing performance. Normally, bones have a smooth surface and are comprised of dense, well-organized lamellar bone material. The rough, porous bone circled in red on the surface of the distal end of the spine is less organized woven bone material that has been deposited rapidly in the body's attempt to buttress an underlying weakness. This new bone is called callus or periosteal callus because the new bone is formed on the periosteal or outer surface of the bone. Because it takes time for this bone to form, we know that it was present before the catastrophic fracture. The distal halves of five scapula from five different racehorses illustrate the progression of changes that culminate in catastrophic fracture. The scapula on the far left is normal. The bone at the end of the spine has a smooth surface of normal color. The next injured bone has subtle changes of early injury, easier to detect by closer viewing and feeling the surface of the bone, subtle discoloration and surface roughness are indicative of bone damage and the beginnings of callus formation. As more bone callus is formed, the enlargement on the spine is more obvious and indicative of stress remodeling. If the underlying weakness and insufficient callus allow excessive movement a crease in the callus forms and is referred to as a stress fracture or incomplete fracture. These weaknesses in the scapula make the bone highly susceptible to breaking and complete fracture under otherwise normal training and racing conditions. Now we are going to look at a computed tomography scan of a fractured scapula. The scout view on the left illustrates the section of the scapula that we will be looking at. The green line illustrates the level of the cross section that can be viewed on the right hand side of the screen. First we will play this as a movie. And as the green line moves proximally we will see a series of transverse or cross sections through the scapula. Now I am going to control the position of the cross section that we are looking at, which you can follow by the green line to illustrate different features about the scapula 
in this fracture. Starting at the distal end, where the green line is, we can see the broad, flat blade of the scapula. We can see one portion of the fracture line, a portion that crosses the distal end of the scapula and enters the glenoid. As we move proximally, or toward the top of the scapula, we begin to see the spine. Notice that the spine projects upward from the flat portion of the scapula. We can still see that fracture line that was coursing from the major fracture line into the glenoid. We are beginning to see some periosteal callus formation on the surface of the scapula and the spine. As we move further proximally, moving from the distal end of the spine into the body of the spine, we see the spine projecting further upward and we see that we have more prominent callus on the surface of the spine. As we continue more proximally, we can see a region of osteoporosis on the tip of the spine. The normal contour of the spine would be right here. And all of this bone on the outside is callus associated with stress remodeling and the stress fracture. Scapular fractures occur during training as well as during racing for both thoroughbred and quarter horse racehorses. Thoroughbred racehorses are just as likely to incur scapular fracture during training as during racing. However, quarter horses are more likely to incur scapular fracture during a race than during a training event. Perhaps this is related to the fact that thoroughbreds more frequently train at high speed than quarter horses. After we determine that the horse has a problem, and it could have a skeletal disorder, there are several diagnostic techniques that can be useful for detection of scapular stress fractures. These include physical examination, ultrasound examination, and bone scan. Radiographs are not useful for detection of scapular stress fractures because the image of the scapula is superimposed over large muscles, the ribs, and other structures in the chest. Consequently, other methods are needed for scapular stress fracture detection. Ultrasound can be used to visualize the spine of the scapula. The contour of the spine is normally smooth and distinct, as illustrated by the yellow dotted line. A thickened spine with irregular, hazy borders, illustrated by the red dotted line, would be indicative of an abnormal bone contour associated with woven bone callus. This particular horse has a bone disease other than stress fracture affecting the spine, but similar bone production. Ultrasound examination is likely to detect only moderate and severe stages of scapular bone remodeling. Therefore, Inability to see bone remodeling is not proof that the horse does not have a scapular stress fracture. I think uh, one of the rewarding things that we've learned from starting to share some of this module with some of our practitioners is that we've actually had veterinary practitioner at the race track or working with race horses diagnose a scapular stress fracture but using palpation and ultrasound. So this is, gives us great encouragement that distribution of these modules is likely to um, uh, help with picking up disorders such as this. The most reliable method for detection of stress fractures is bone scan, also called nuclear scintigraphy. Bone scans detect abnormal metabolic activity, which occurs early and throughout the course of stress fracture development. Thus, bone scan is a sensitive indicator of scapular pathology in early and late stages of disease. Hot spots are indicative of intense bone metabolic activity, characteristic of stress remodeling and stress fractures. After visualizing the boundaries of the scapula indicated by the dotted blue line and the spine of the scapula indicated by the dotted yellow line, an abnormal hot spot can be seen on this bone scan. 
Note the typical location at the distal end of the spine on the neck of the scapula. So let's test your knowledge. What is the most sensitive diagnostic technique for detection of a scapular stress fracture? Radiographs or x-rays, ultrasound examination, or bone scan? Click on the correct answer. That is incorrect. The scapula is very difficult to visualize on radiographs. Large muscles in the shoulder region, ribs, and structures within the chest or neck are superimposed on images of the scapula, making it almost impossible to visualize bone callus associated with a scapular stress fracture. That is correct. Bone scans are very sensitive at detecting altered bone metabolism that accompanies bone injury and bone responses to injury. A bone scan is highly likely to detect bone remodeling of the scapula. An absence of remodeling is highly likely to indicate that the horse does not have a scapular stress fracture at the time of bone scan. However, a bone scan is relatively expensive and takes time to perform. More detailed information on scapular fractures can be found in these publications. Key points are summarized in a Racing Injury Prevention Program technical note. So I think those uh, technical notes were included in your, um, included in the handout with today's session. And I uh, just wanted to reiterate that our goal is really to distribute the information that we've learned over the years um, through uh, much hard work, through many funding agencies, many, many people have spoken today, but the messages that we need to get are to trainers and veterinarians and people actually practicing at the racetrack. That's the reason that we're putting a large effort into continuing education where we want to make sure that um, racehorse trainers, that the information is delivered at a level that uh, they can comprehend and is useful for them, but also useful for veterinarians and all other people working with the industry. As Dr. Arthur mentioned, the uh, first set of modules that we hope to have, that we will actually have finished by the middle of 2013 should address at least 75% of musculoskeletal fatalities and their associated pre-existing injuries. We continue to develop modules over the next three years, and we certainly are open to facilitating module development for uh, anyone that's interested in, in working with us. I'd like to thank the California Horse Racing Board and this racing safety program for furthering uh, these continuing education efforts. Thank you. a little injury modules now, but we intend to uh, pursue other modules. Uh, obviously, there is an opportunity for uh, uh, drug testing, pharmacology, medication use, uh, particularly, in, in fact, we're actually thinking about uh, requiring someone who has had a, a uh, medication violation to actually sit through one of these modules, similar, I guess, if you have a a uh, speeding ticket if you if you want to get some consideration. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for this, not only in terms of what uh, Sue's area of expertise, but in pharmacology, drug testing, uh, workman's comp, business management, uh, some of the things we've seen on all the panels here so far today. So uh, I think there is an opportunity, so thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I want to thank the Jockey Club for the opportunity to share with you the status of Indiana's continuing education program for trainers. Uh, I hope you will find our experience in Indiana helpful. Uh, there are two things that I'd like uh, all of you, uh, especially regulators, uh, to take away from this presentation. Uh, number one, you can do this. If Indiana can require continuing education for trainers, there is no reason why you can't. Number two, if you choose to pursue continuing education program for your state, 
You can count on Indiana to assist you in any way we can. The genesis of Indiana's continuing education program is a model rule passed by the RCI in 2010. This rule calls for a trainer to complete four hours of continuing education starting in 2012 in order to retain licensing privileges as a trainer. In other words, this model rule calls for a nationwide mandated continuing education program for all trainers. Unfortunately, this happens to be one of those model rules that gets enthusiastically endorsed by the RCI and the racing industry, but then sits on the shelf, forgotten, or at least forgotten by most. To my knowledge, only South Dakota and Indiana has made trainer CE a requirement of licensure. We passed our rule because it was the right thing to do, regardless of other states felt likewise. This rule is not the most popular rule we have passed, uh, but that's to be expected. In my 20 plus years as a regulator in Indiana, I have found that almost every rule that adds a new requirement upon any category of licensee is unpopular. But when considering a new initiative, the best interest of the sport, not its popularity, is, or at least should be, the determining factor. We approved this rule in March 2010. A copy has been provided in your packet of material. But let me read it to you. Beginning in 2013, trainers must demonstrate prior to licensure that they have attended a four-hour continuing education course approved by the commission within the past two calendar years. Trainers completing an improved continuing education course in 2011 or 2012 will have met the res this requirement through the 2014 racing season. The continuing education requirement does not apply to trainers who have started six or fewer horses or six or fewer times in Indiana the previous year. Such trainers may start up to six horses in a year before he or she must fulfill the continuing education requirement. So what this rule means is that the Indiana Horse Racing Commission has been working over two years providing continuing education opportunities for trainers. Now is the time for implementation. In 2013, our trainers must have completed our CE requirement prior to licensure in Indiana. In a few minutes, I will get back to the rationale behind the threshold of six starts for our CE requirement. We have held four continuing ed seminars for thoroughbred trainers. The first two in 2011 were sponsored by the Indiana HBPA. We have had two this year, both sponsored by the Indiana Horse Racing Commission. We have held most of our seminars in the afternoon at the track after training hours. We race at night in Indiana. I suggest for those of you who have daytime racing to hold your seminars in the afternoon on a dark day. We try to keep our seminars as upbeat as possible. We begin at noon, there is no fee, our tracks provide a complimentary lunch, and all you can eat pizza buffet and soft drinks. Our speakers begin at one o'clock. We have had some great presenters that have included professors from Purdue University's College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, their topics have included uh, predicting and preventing fractures, diagnosing and treating upper respiratory issues, diagnosing and treating lower respiratory issues. Dr. Scott Waterman has twice discussed corticosteroids and other joint therapies. Other topics we have addressed include immigration issues, workers' compensation coverage, biosecurity, medication issues, and, if we, had, and we have had a Q&A with our chief state steward. Our seminars have been well received. 
Most of the attendees are fully engaged. They ask good questions. They ask, they, ask, they ask questions, they ask good questions, and they ask lots of questions. It's not uncommon to see trainers six deep at the break waiting to meet our speakers. The feedback from our post-seminar surveys have been very positive. Over 250 trainers have attended our four seminars. That includes 18 of the top 20 trainers by number of starts and 85 of the top 100 by number of starts. So I believe we will be in good shape when we begin mandating CE accreditation for the first time next spring. The rule I read mentions a provision that gives a threshold of six starts before the CE requirement kicks in. This was done in order to encourage trainers from out of state which participate in our racing program, but do so to a very limited extent to continue shipping their horses to Indiana. We get a lot of shippers from Kentucky and other neighboring states, and we want that to continue. I should note that in Indiana, trainers with seven or more starts, those that are subject to our CE requirement, represent over 85% of our starters. There has been some discussion about making continuing ed voluntary, not mandatory. Uh, let's not kid ourselves. Instead, let's be realistic. No group responds to voluntary educational opportunities in any significant numbers. Let's consider other type of occupational licenses issued by the state. It's likely that every attorney in this room is required by their state to take CLE classes as a condition of their license renewal. It's likely because only five states do not require mandatory continuing ed for attorneys. Let's look a little closer to home. Let's look at veterinarians. In Indiana, a veterinarian must complete 30 hours of continuing ed every two years. That's Indiana. How about Kentucky? Well, Kentucky's requirements are the same as Indiana, 30 hours every two years. Is there any compelling rationale uh, not to require continuing ed for trainers? No, of course there isn't. Uh, Dr. Stova, Dr. Arthur, and the California Horse Racing Board have done some very impressive work and this impressive work deserves a wide audience. Their vital presentations should not lay dormant in some dark, neglected cubbyhole in cyberspace. Uh, speaking of cyberspace, we are also looking into adding an online component to our CE program. This would dovetail nicely with our live, in-person seminars. We believe that an online option will be most helpful to those trainers who are not stabled on the grounds. It will also be a savior for those trainers who wait till the last minute to take care of their business. We are now looking for content. Uh, we hope the Grayson Jockey Club Research Foundation will allow us to use their fine video that uh, Mr. Bowen referred to earlier, the hoof inside and out. This is the kind of education material that should be seen by all horsemen. If anyone in this room hasn't seen this, you should, you'd be very impressed. And likewise, the work of Dr. Stover and Rick and the California Horse Racing Board, uh, this presentation that they just showed us, I think is excellent. Uh, I'm delighted to hear that there's going to be uh, six more by mid-year and more in the hopper after that. Uh, this is the kind of material that uh, really all trainers need to see. And the only way it, that they're gonna see it is if you require them to come to a seminar or go online and make them watch it. And once they're in the room or once they're in front of the computer, they're gonna warm up to the material and they'll get a lot out of it. But we have to do our jobs basically to put them in a position 
where they're in front of the material. Let me share with you how we plan to administer our rule. We keep track of CE participation by simply taking attendance at each seminar and posting a cumulative list of all those individuals on the commission's website. When a trainer applies for a license next year, we will verify to see if they are on our master list. If they are on our list, they will be good to go. However, if a person is not on that list, we will check the number of starts he or she had in Indiana in 2012. Based on our findings, one of two things would happen. For a trainer that has had seven or more starts, their license application will be pended until he or she completes the CE program. So the answer to, your que to the question that if someone who raced in Indiana, raced more than seven, to seven or more times this year, comes next year, and he hasn't complete, uh, completed the CE requirement, will he get a license? And the answer is no. He will not receive a license till he completes the CE requirement. For a trainer that has six or fewer starts this year, he or she will receive a license with a condition that they complete the CE requirement before their seventh start in Indiana next year. Once they start six times, they will be prohibited from starting until, the, uh, until they meet our requirement. Uh, in closing, I'd like to thank you for your interest in this topic. I hope you all believe that mandatory continuing ed for trainers is not only doable, but worth doing. Thank you.